If we are live, okay. There it goes. Hi. <laughs> I am so, so, so happy to see four great, great friends who actually happen to all play the bassoon. Oh, yeah. uh, but I have to first introduce myself. My name is Carlos Miguel Prieto, and I'm music director of the Louisiana Philharmonic. And ever since this crazy thing started, we've had these uh, Thursday uh, happy hour uh, meetings and they've actually involved many many people and uh, and uh, well what what's important today is for me to tell you that we have the bassoon section from the Louisiana Philharmonic with a very very special guest Andrew Brady uh, and I'll I'll ask each of you uh, to say hello. Uh, we'll start with our guest, Let, uh, Andrew. It's very very nice seeing your face. Uh, tell us about you. Where are you from? How are you doing? Yeah, it's good to see your face too. Um, and I don't consider myself a guest. I think it feels very at home. But um, yeah, so I'm from Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee. Um, I was in the LPO as principal bassoon from 2013 to 2016. And then I moved to Atlanta um, for the principal position here. Um, so I've been here since then, and that's where I am now in Atlanta. And Jack Pena, who's our principal bassoon. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, so I am from a, Carrollton, Texas. It's a suburb of Dallas. And um, I'm coming live from uh, New Orleans. Michael Matushek, how are you? Hey, hey, everybody. I also grew up in a suburb of Dallas uh, called Plano, very close to Jack. And I'm currently uh, not in the Orpheum, as you might think, <laughs> but uh, in my home in Metairie. Ben. Hi, everybody. I grew up in Houston, Texas. Does anyone know who I went to high school with? I feel like you told me, and I forgot. I absolutely know. Most famous person you know? Queen Beyonce. Beyonce? <laughs> Beyonce, okay. And then next, this coming season will be my 15th season with the LPA. Your what? 15th season. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 50, eh? <laughs> he looks good for his age. <laughs> yeah, like, what did I miss? Okay. So tell us about Beyonce. I mean, but it's just, uh, he, she's like, how was she in school? It's hard to get her to to be patient. Like she wanted to be around me all the time. <laughs> As everybody does. <laughs> to like get this thing where I blocked her number and you know. Oh my God. <laughs> it's on pretty strong, but you know, we're okay now. She understands that we have separate lives. Was she as musical as you? She was, I mean, she didn't even graduate, you know, she oh. left um, as a junior, I think. So. She took lessons with you, right? <laughs> you know, wait, did you go to, did you go to HSPVA? Yes. I did, did Lizzo go there? Uh, possibly, I, I only have recently. Or did she go to U of H? Oh. That, I feel like that's right. Yeah, I think she went to U of H, okay. So I, I'm trying, trying to, uh, trying to know, uh, did you ever attempt to give Beyonce bassoon lessons? Yeah, no, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> doing that, but you know, actually, when 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 she was at school, they had the group Destiny's Child, and so it was um, three people um, at the time. But Beyonce was the most famous. Wow! Well, so, Andrew, do you have a do you have a similarly famous high school friend? No, I wish I could say I did. Nobody comes from Johnson City, Tennessee. I guess we did. We did have. He wasn't a friend. He graduated before I um, got to high school, but he came back and did like a graduation speech. Um, his name is Matt Chuckry which you probably don't know who that is, but he was on um, Gilmore Girls. Um, I think it's, was it Logan? 
was he was a recurring character. He was like the boyfriend of um, Rory, if anybody remembers Gilmore Girls. So unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, and also if you watch, um, yeah, <laughs> if you watch Orange Is the New Black, um, Yoga Jones is from Johnson City, Tennessee. Wow. Yep. So I I have a weird question for you guys because you know. Yeah, why did you start playing the bassoon? I know it's not a weird question, but uh, just let's start with Jack. I mean, it, what, what, what was it? Somebody who forced you, convinced you, you liked it, etc. Okay, so the story goes basically that when when you like go into middle school, which is sixth grade in Texas, um, you that's usually when you pick an instrument to play. And so I went when I was in fifth grade to go try out for the band program to see what instrument I wanted to play. And there were all these poster boards all around the band hall where there were a bunch of numbers on it. And like clarinet had like a hundred numbers because they would allow a hundred people to play the clarinet. And there were only two spots for the bassoon. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what any of the instruments were. Maybe I knew what the tuba was or something. But I thought the bassoon sounded like the word buffoon, and I thought it was funny. And there were only two spots, and I was like, oh, that one's really exclusive, so I want to do that one. And so then I tried the, the reed, and my dad and I used to go hunting um, as, when I was a kid in Texas, and my dad thought it sounded like a duck call. So he was like, oh, this is perfect. And so then I ended up playing the bassoon. So that's my story. How about you, Michael? Uh, we also did the, you know, visit the band when you're rising from fifth, fifth to sixth grade to do the instrument tryouts. And uh, I didn't really have an aptitude for any of them in particular. Uh, but they told me that the bassoon, you had to have really good grades to play, perpetuating the nerdy bassoonist stereotype. And uh, as a very over eager young nerd, uh, that was really appealing to me. So I went with the bassoon. And Ben? Well, in um, eighth grade, I was playing saxophone in the band, and we were playing at the football game. And we were at the top of the bleachers. We were, we were doing the Hey song. And we took a break, time for some, some hot dogs. And I put my saxophone down, and I accidentally kicked it. And it fell down the bleachers. It was a berry sax. And it fell down every bleacher. It, hit. it was like in slow motion. It, hit, hit. and then it's and then it fell to the floor. And I looked up at the the band director, and she said, "That was our last saxophone. Now you play the bassoon." <laughs> so you were never you were never you know you know my, oboe or anything. You were never forced to play the oboe. I've never even tried to play the oboe. Really? You and Jared haven't switched instruments? I've never put an oboe reed in my mouth. Wow. Really? Nor, wow. nor like when you were little, you know, so I want to be an oboe. No, it was, I like the oboe. I like listening to it. Um, I appreciate the work that goes into playing the oboe. And I think I appreciated it to a point where I wanted to avoid it. <laughs> that, that's well said. That's the most honest answer you can give. Yeah. And, I like and I, if I remember correctly, Andrew, you you like play every single thing that you, that you know. If, if I, tell, tell us that I know you play bassoon, flute, uh, trumpet. No, no, no trumpet. trumpet. <laughs> Drum? Is that right? Drum? No, no? <laughs> just wins. Just wins. Okay, just just wins. So yeah, which which was first? Saxophone. Oh, so saxophone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my then... oldest. I have two older sisters. One played clarinet. One played saxophone. Um, and so I took after my older sister played saxophone. Um, but then I switched to bassoon in eighth grade. Um, I didn't have to drop my saxophone to want to switch. Um, <laughs> I just, I saw a bassoon at um, a band clinic. I was playing sax and I was sitting behind one. Um, and I thought some of the thumb keys looked really cool. So I just wanted to play it because it looked cool. Um, and then along the way, I kind of dabbled in flute and for marching band, I did sousaphone. Um, 
stole my sister's clarinet a few times just to play around. But I'm not the only one that plays more than one instrument. Um, Jack plays flute as well. Um, Michael plays recorder too. He's the one that got me into recorder. So. Wow. Yeah. So, is, is this because bassoon is 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 like not not enough? I actually have a theory about this. <laughs> so. I feel like, okay, so when you're a kid and you start playing the bassoon and you're a talented musician, the bassoon parts in band are very easy when you're in middle school and high school. I mean, it says on your part, it says tuba, trombone, and bassoon. And so you're playing the same music as them. And so we get bored. And so we're like, ah, oh, might as well learn one of these other instruments. And so you end up learning some, some other stuff. That's my theory. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty fitting. Yeah. So, I'd like to ask you a very, very, a question that only bassoonists will understand. Well, I guess hardly. What is the least, let, let's assume that you are in the finals of an audition, you know, wherever, in heaven. And what is the deep one passage that you don't want to see in that final? The one passage. I'll go ahead and speak up. So it's one that is on the list like kind of all the time and it's the bane of my existence. And I have no shame in admitting that I have very rarely actually played it correctly. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, the fast section from Till Erlenspiegel. Like I've always just crapped on it, um, and I hate seeing it in auditions because it doesn't really tell you that much. There's plenty of other stuff um, that people can ask that will show your technical facility, um, and yes, I mean you should be able to play it, and I definitely have work to do on it. But it's for me, it would not be telling enough as an excerpt to to make me want to pass or um, you know uh, kick out someone from a certain round. Okay. And that one's so frustrating too, because when you're actually playing the piece in the orchestra, like that bassoon part doesn't really come through very well. Yep. <laughs> so is that any any other ideas about the one excerpt you don't want to see? Oh, I don't want to see Figaro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I should not have said that. I think we need all need to be careful what we say, because then it's going to be on all these auditions. No, so. no, no. <laughs> I'm thinking carefully. <laughs> Dad, so which one? Um, I think, I, I think, you know, when you take auditions and you play different excerpts, you just like end up getting like different hangups on them. And um, mine is definitely from Polchinella, the Gavotte. I just get so in my head because it's, it's like, I mean, it's, it's not super fast and it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a twister with your thumbs. And if you doubt yourself for even a second, you just can fall apart and you can crack notes. and. I've actually messed up on that so many times in auditions, but like, I feel like if I played it live, it would be fine. <laughs> Not to break order, but I have a, um, it wasn't the Gavotte for um, my LPO audition, but it was the Toccata from um, Polchinella. And that was asked, and I think it was in the semi-final round. Um, and I played it once, totally just like crashed and burned. Um, the panel was like, would you like to do that again? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I went after it, started, got like five notes in, and I was like, no, this doesn't feel right. Like, can't do it. So I stopped again, started again, still crapped on it. <laughs> and, and I was just like, at that point, I was like, there's no way that, you know, this is going to get me any further. But thankfully, um, that wasn't, you know, all that the round hinged upon. So... Uh, just, you know, advice, you know, you don't have to nail everything in That's a single true. round to pass, so. Uh, and then what's, what's your nightmare passage? I don't know. I don't really like seeing the Mozart concerto, mm. which is hard to avoid because it's on every one. <laughs> I kind of agree with you, Ben. How many, how, how many Vivaldi concerti? Mm, what is it? How many, how many concerti for bassoon did Vivaldi write? 37, 37. 37. And, and how many are good? 37. <laughs> really? No. 
<laughs> I mean, is is there like, is there like the one that everyone does because E minor, E minor. Okay, and uh, well, I want to ask you another another um, interesting question. Some of you shared teachers, right? Yeah. So at, at at least three of you had one same teacher at some point, didn't you? And who was that? This is a very complicated question. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting to me because the world of bassoon is like, it, it's like all these, you know, you go from teacher to, and, and, the, and I, I just somehow always see three or four names. Yeah. Uh, and, and you all studied with, I think maybe the same one or two of them. Well, I will say for, to start off that Michael and I had the same teacher in high school. And so we, we both had the same teacher in high school and then Andrew and I had the same undergrad teacher. And then Michael, Ben and I also had the same grad teacher. Who Andrew, you also studied with him at festival, right? I had, yeah, music academy. And who is that? So that there's one teacher that all four of you studied with. Ben Caymans. Ben Caymans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know Ben very well, and I, I love Ben, and he is um, actually, Ben and I did a tour of the Mexican state of Veracruz playing Mozart bassoon concerto. And that tour was many years ago, okay? I'm not even gonna try to count. But in that tour, uh, we played in, in two good halls and everything else was churches in the middle of nowhere. And churches that were already full with, filled with people before the orchestra was ever set up. Which means that Ben always had to play the Mozart and there was always somebody sitting about this close <laughs> to his bassoon and reacting and you know and people in Mexico would not let him go without playing encore so uh, by the middle of the tour he told me well you know how we've always played as an encore this repeated movement from the concerto well there's a very simple piece that I could come up with and uh, and it's called Dead Elvis. Uh, that's where, that's when I got to know this crazy piece. So we did Dead Elvis in churches. Um, and uh, this, this is one of my most incredible memories. And he's, he's I really, really um, cannot forget that. Um, so that this is this, are there any, any recent bassoon concerti that you consider like essential i and by recent you can choose whenever you want in the last 10 20 30 years uh, i really like the concerto by sofia kubaitalina it's not mm -hmm. terribly recent it's from the 70s um but it's definitely a you know the the seminal late 20th century um bassoon work uh it's got a lot of extended technique in it and it's for a really interesting ensemble of uh bassoon uh four celli and three basses it's not often performed because the string parts are microtonal uh, so there's obviously no piano reduction um, so it's not something that a lot of people get a chance to play without going through the big hassle of putting together a group which uh, a conductor friend of mine and i did in undergrad and it was really fun uh, but it's a really neat piece i definitely recommend that it's all in very low registers, isn't it? It's, uh... Yeah, it, well, the bassoon part gets very, very high. But yeah, the string parts can get very muddy and way down there in very, very dense clusters of pitches. So are, are, are there any like major bassoon concertos by like living American composers or, or, or major American composers in the last? Uh, John Williams. John Williams, yeah. And is that, is that a cool piece? Yeah, I enjoy it. I was actually, sorry, cats wanting attention. Um, I was actually scheduled, well, am, 
technically scheduled to play it with the ASO in November, but I mean, there's probably no way that's going to be able to happen. It's a large orchestra with piano, harp, percussion, celesta, um, and a large string section and brass section, so I just can't imagine that I'd be able to perform it. Um, and funnily enough, I was thinking, like, well, what can I do if that gets changed? And I was thinking about the Goodbye Delina. Um, so that could be an option. That actually, the Goodbye Delina is, is a piece that you can do separating the instruments. And somehow that probably would sound even better because uh, that, that would. The, the, if, you, if you space out all the basses and the cellos maybe in front or something would be that would be one of those amazing amazing things um they just i i'm just always curious to know why american composers have kind of put aside the bassoon um when um you the u.s has so you know amazing amazing bassoon players and uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure that if I start looking for good bassoon concertos, but uh, by American composers, I'll fi I'll find them. But they don't come to mind, like you know, for clarinet or for uh, for flute. And uh, so you are you. If if you are given the option, let's say, to either do the Goodbye Dolina or delay the Williams for one season, what would you prefer, Andrew? What, what's your... Well, I mean, I've always wanted to play the Williams, so I'd probably go for that. Um, I think both pieces are really cool and have their um, unique kind of sound worlds. Um, but just because I've, you know, that was one of the first pieces that I was introduced to um, when I started taking private lessons. Um, not so much to actually work on it, but um, just listening. Um, my teacher wanted to play me recordings of different bassoonists so I could get an idea of how the instrument sounds. Um, and so that was one of the first things I heard and it's just always stuck with me. So it's it's been a long time coming and hopefully it won't be too much longer till I get a chance to perform it. Uh, ben, you you play amazingly well the contrabass tone. So t tell us how that, how, how you got into being a contrabassoon specialist. Hmm. Well, to, to keep going with the, the bassoon, like starting the bassoon, I just, when, even when I played the saxophone, I went right to the, the berry sax. So I don't know, I just like the low parts, I like the bass. I don't like to move that fast if I don't have to. And uh, there is actually growing up, because my dad played oboe um, in Houston Symphony, he uh, played a, a Gunther Schuller contrabassoon concerto for me when I had just started playing it. And um, Really, all I can remember, I didn't, I didn't really understand too much about what I was hearing or the contrabassoon or how it fit in with the orchestra, but I just, I love the rumble. I love the sound it makes. I thought, I thought it was kind of a disturbance to that pretty violin or pretty piano. It was like, it was like challenging to make that kind of instrument sound a way that you know, people don't think it's just flatulence. You know, on on that topic, because uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the of the contrabassoon, and I, there are some notes in the contrabassoon in the repertoire that I just absolutely look forward to. But I'll just tell you a story about the very well known uh, Ravel left hand piano concerto so for my first let, let's say that for my first professional 10 years of my career life i never was able to to hear the notes in that okay i'm not i'm not gonna say where or that happened or why or whatever but it for 10 years i was frustrated 
by just hearing this rumbling. Like that, okay? And I really appreciate when contrabassoon players play the melody right. And uh, I, I know this is very dumb and you, 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 all you guys are uh, of a very high technical level so that you kind of take that as a, as a given. However, I question myself because it, these 10 years was not only in one orchestra, it was like about five orchestras. And uh, so I, I think it's like, was Ravel, what was he trying to say with that? I mean, is, it, is that like one of those like things like, hey, here, here you go, let's see if you can play this or, or or was there in France a specialty for the contrabassoon? Is that right? I don't know. Do you think he ever heard it how he wanted? Or I, I you know, frankly, I have I have no idea. I I am convinced that changing repertoire, Stravinsky, if Stravinsky would be alive and would see with let's say how how well you guys play the right of spring the opening he would probably change it that's my theory because i i think he wanted that to sound like terribly stren strenuous and almost impossible to play so would you say that in your instrument the technical level has just gone up and up and up and up w would you agree with that yeah. yeah. Well, Jack, or, or Andrew. Well, well, well. Yeah, I mean, I think for every instrument, um, especially, yeah, yeah, I would say, I think for every instrument, the level has gone up. And I, I think that's kind of the goal, um, is that we just keep increasing our abilities, um, as long as it doesn't only become about, you know, technical proficiency, um, and there's still communication happening. Um, and expressing what the music is meant for. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, a bassoonist, I think a lot of bassoonists graduating um, college these days could probably play circles around some older bassoonists that had jobs. Um, it's just that the technical level has gotten so much higher and that's just a product of teaching and continuing to further our um, understanding of the instrument. Is that is that mostly from teaching or is there also a technical part of the instrument that's that's improved no there really hasn't been much improvement to the bassoon i'll let somebody else talk but well it's as far as the repertoire i would say that that's definitely a factor um you know the, the bassoon didn't really come to its current form until what like the turn of the 20th century um and you know wind instruments in general you know the, the violin's been the violin for 300 years um, but since our instruments are more mechanically complicated um, you know what we were working with in the late classical or romantic era um, was pretty primitive compared to the bassoons we play today um, which is one, you know, one reason why uh, we don't see super technical you know a lot of crazy bassoon fireworks in some of the older repertoire so but uh, it's still unclear to me whether the instrument itself has has undergone many changes in the last, let's say, 50 years. No. No? no our, I think most of us play on bassoons that are o over 50 years old, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, so in the case of bassoons, uh, old could mean good. Could. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. I played on my last instrument um, before the one I just bought um, was built in 1927 and was a phenomenal instrument so all four of us play on bassoons made by heckel um which is the uh, kind of the original bassoon maker they invented the modern bassoon um they're based in germany and bassoonists um kind of get to know the different eras of heckel bassoon manufacturing and the different characteristics that the instruments tend to have from different eras so you know for me i really like the ones from like the 1950s and 60s so i look for that but if somebody wanted a more uh, contemporary style bassoon, and for them, older would not be better. Um, 
but the differences we're talking about are it's not like um, there's notes that a brand new bassoon can play that my 1952 bassoon can't it's more issues of you know tone and color and little shadings like that cool so now whenever i've interviewed a section you're like a small section i've interviewed like cello sections violin section i always have asked one question uh that has nothing to do with music i guess it does but who is the best dancer of the four of you jack jack <laughs> All Can right. you demonstrate, Jack? Can you just stand up and <laughs> give us a little taste? <laughs> so, so within Jack's dancing abilities, what kind of music is it makes you just just get up and dance? OK, so there, there's a spectrum. Um, I will say there's a lot of there's a lot of pop in there. But also, as Andrew knows, there's a lot of Baroque in there. Um, Andrew and I really relate on that level. Um, we'll send each other recordings, especially of recorder concertos, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and we're like, this is like the, this is, I don't, what do we even call it? How do we call that? What do we say? Oh, about it? You're like, oh, this slaps or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, you know, you're not going to hear recorder concertos when you're out and about. But like that, like, you know, some of the like Baroque music. Vivaldi and Rameau and you know like that's got a lot of beats in it. Prokofiev too. I, mean, that's I was about Prokofiev. to say don't forget Prokofiev. Yeah. <laughs> you dance you dance to Baroque music and to Prokofiev. Oh I'm not like I think that those like are very like they make me want to like move my body but I'm not like actually doing you know like I'm not like getting up and like doing a, a dance. He's not walking down the street with a boombox, you know, blasting yeah. Prokofiev Five. Well, I mean, that, that that's an interesting question because uh, would you would you consider it wrong to have a bassoonist some somehow, you know, get up and dance in the middle of an orchestral piece? Somebody like Jack who can dance well. I, I'm, I'm sure. Talking. Would you do it? Uh, probably not, but. <laughs> You know, I'm sure there are people that would do that. I don't consider myself a good dancer, but I probably dance more than the other people in the room. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd say if the composer asks for it, I mean, Jack's a consummate professional, so if it's on the page, well, he's going to do it. Michael's right about that. I will do whatever is on the page. <laughs> and more. You no, know, it's a lot better if you're not alone. Like, if someone else is dancing too, then I feel better. You know, if I can just, like, you know, get Michael up with me and dance. That'd be great. Well, but, Carlos dances on the podium all the time. I know you need someone close. Well, to you. That's, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't doesn't mean I dance well. Okay, I, but you know, I have one more question. Another question: Who is the best singer? Andrew. <laughs> I didn't want to volunteer myself, but. <laughs> so, are you? Are you, are, you, are you a good enough singer that you could like sing in front of a, an audience on stage in front of an or orchestra? Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> to be fair, I haven't heard Michael or Ben sing, but I have heard him sing. No? I sing all the time, but for fun. I, no, I would not stand in front of an orchestra. Uh, why, why is it that... that or you know, musician, classical musicians in general are so shy about these things. Is there, is there something that, that, that you are taught in conservatory that says, you know, you shall never dance in public or you shall never sing in public or, or is, what, why is that? I think we're just, you know, we're taught in conservatories and or whatever your higher learning is that we should be doing this profession to the nth degree possible. And we feel like if we, if there's something, you know, like singing or whatever it is that is not our main thing, um, if we're going to do it, it should be at an extremely high level. Because that's just what we're, I mean, we're trained to be the best at what we do. Um, so, I mean, there are benefits to not caring about it and just, I mean, for me, that's what recorder is. 
Um, like, it's just fun. It's an escape. Like, don't have to worry about scraping reads or um, playing super in tune or response. I just do it for fun. But of course, I'm doing it at home, so. You just made me think about uh, something that happened to me um, with Strauss, Don Quixote. And you, you know, Don Quixote that has a prominent viola part um, that embodies Sancho Panza. Okay, so sure. I, I was doing that piece with uh, Chicago Civic Orchestra. It's, it's, I think that's the name. It's the, the Young Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Yo-Yo Ma was the soloist. And, you know, I had already had like two or three rehearsals with the orchestra. The orchestra sounded great, but they all sounded like, like, you know, very well-behaved, fabulous musicians. So uh, Yo-Yo and I tried something. Actually, there was an audience when that happened, but we tried because Sancho Panza in Don Quixote is always walking. He's always walking right next to the donkey that Don Quixote is. Not, that he's always either walking or riding the donkey, but he's always moving. So we asked the viola player, who's she's a fantastic viola player, playing with perfect accuracy and also no character, and um, looking at me, seeing if you know she could follow me or whatever. So we came up with an idea. Uh, I asked her, do you know this from memory? And she said, yes, because I assure you, you know so many pieces from memory already, yet you know, we still have that piece, piece of paper in front. So I said to her, would you mind just going, this was in, in, in uh, Chicago Symphony Hall, so it was, it, was, it was with an audience. Would you mind playing this solo while walking around the hall? <laughs> so like completely separated from the orchestra. You can go wherever you want. And you, you know the piece, um, just play it wherever you want and moving around. To my great surprise, he said, sure, I'll do it. There we go. So she chose like the balcony, got to the balcony and her level of playing was just as good. Her, you know, she was perfectly together with the orchestra and her level of character was just like over the roof. And uh, that made me think, um, Yo-Yo is obsessive about this. I'm not as obsessive, but you know, Let's just go to the next part. We made that continue with the con with the bass clarinet, with whoever had a solo, the tuba, the tenor tuba, whoever had a solo was allowed to do whatever she or he wanted. And uh, it was an unbelievable experience. And it, it actually made the orchestra completely change in attitude. Uh, so much that the whole opening, the whole introduction, which is a kind of potpourri, orchestral potpourri, the orchestra played it without the conductor or the soloist on stage. So the orchestra started and the soloist and myself walked in right before variation one, like seconds before variation one. And the orchestra sounded so much better. So since you are four great musicians from great conservatories, great teachers, great careers, etc., would you say that music education today is missing something in that sense? Liberty, personality, character, or would you say it's, it's fine the way it is? I'd say the getting an orchestra job part is, is the part that beats that out of you, <laughs> right? If you're, all those people in Chicago Civic, you know, they're all taking a lot of auditions. They're either just out of school or in grad school. And 
you get so focused, like Andrew said, on doing everything to the absolute perfect highest degree that uh, it's easy to forget that it's supposed to be fun to do and fun to listen to and that you're supposed to communicate a feeling instead of, uh, you know, a bunch of notes. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's a, a big factor for us. And I think not only just getting a job, but the difference um, of American orchestras and European orchestras, um, which I might get some flack for saying this, but whatever, um, I have tenure. Um, <laughs> so I just feel like um, American orchestral culture, um, it's very much about um, assimilation, uniformity, um, you know, being together as an ensemble, being in tune, um, and just really trying to act as one, um, which there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, but I feel like it's taken so far um, down a certain path that we forget, like Michael was saying, we forget the humanity of it. Um, and so it, it, I feel like, it, like you said, um, with the violists and the other soloists, the bass clarinetists, um, I think people are wanting permission to be expressive. Um, because that's just not how we approach playing an orchestra. We're, especially as a wind player, we're focusing on blending with our um, colleagues and our section mates and also all the other woodwinds. Um, so it, it's hard for us to sometimes step out of that box and really um, show our creativity and expression. Um, so that's my, that's my one kind of bugaboo, I guess. Um, and I, I hope there's a change, um, but we'll, we'll see. Well, and Jack, I mean, because I, I'm never, you you are, you don't seem to be on stage at all a shy person. I mean, not very shy, no. No, no not shy at all. So, what were you like in conservatory? <laughs> Andrew's laughing because he, <laughs> he knows. Um, I think conservatory was, it was a big change for me just because it was it was like so different from what I had grown up doing but um I really always just wanted to bond with my colleagues a lot and my teacher and my teacher there uh, Richard Dean was like he was my teacher he was the dean he was like also my best friend he was he was great he cared about me as a person and as my playing and I, I found that to be very helpful. He was extremely hard on me. I mean, I thought I was the worst for so long, but like, it, it's 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 so. It, I think it was it was really good, a good thing for me because when you're a kid, sometimes you just kind of coast by on this like, oh, I'm I'm better than you know the, the one other bassoon player at my school, or you know like, you know I'm doing well in Texas, you know, so you don't really realize how much you need to be practicing. And then you get to conservatory and someone's like, you know, I got there and Andrew was there already. And he was a couple years older than me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm horrible at the bassoon. <laughs> so I was like, I need to practice. And so all I did was it really, it kicked me into shape. But um, I think I, I was, um, I had this phase where speaking on terms of like being obsessed with perfection where years at conservatory, I was really worried about playing in tune and doing all the right things. Oh, everyone's bringing their cats. <laughs> She's wanting attention, right, sorry. So. <laughs> but I think once I started feeling more confident in those areas, it was easier for me to open up musically as well. So it's just kind of one of those things. I will just say, to, oh, sorry. I'll say too that um, I think you were being pushed, not because you were bad, sorry, cat hair swimming, or, not because you were bad or needed to like seriously improve, uh, improve in certain areas, I just think uh, Richard recognized how much talent was there to be tapped. I remember the first master, or not master class, but studio class where you played, and it was probably some like dinky little mildy scale study, or maybe like a John Court etude. And like halfway through you playing, like Bean and I just looked at each other and we're like, "He's good." <laughs> so I, yeah, I think he pushed you because he knew there was so much that you could do. So, wow. Ben, in in your case. Uh, I, I want to go back to this idea of, uh, your fo you know, because I also know your father very well and I admire him very much. And I, I wanted to know if you could share with us, how is it to grow up in a household um, like yours? 
and being a musician is it is it uh, more pressure less pressure i mean when you're a kid i think when you're growing up your your house is really your reality it's not until you get more exposure and see what other families grow up like that you notice that it's a little different in how you know we ate dinner very early we ate dinner you know according to his schedule because there's so much that you have to do to be prepared to go to work and i don't know like touring and he would leave and he would always come back with little presents even when we were young they would go on their european tours and he'd come back with things and they'd have all kinds of shirts like I just remember uh, it was a very big influence because it was such a such a big part of his life. Like that was the same thing that everyone's saying with the conservatory. Like he did uh, in the '70s when he went to Juilliard, and it was that intense focus of there's like in high school, you know, you like the instrument, and then in college you 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 get to this this great school with this amazing teacher and same story like there's there's a few teachers of oboe that are just the ones you hear and um you know it's just uh it's just kind of you you are around the best of the best and you also want to succeed so you start to just focus and um I don't know. It was it was it was very lucky. Like I'm very I'm very fortunate to grow up that way because um, I was exposed to music as a language from from the beginning. Oh, I love that language. Uh, is there such a thing as a jazz bassoonist? Mm -hmm. Oh, and what? Do Are there any in New Orleans? Hmm. My favorite jazz bassoonist is Stuart McKay. If you've ever heard a recording of him, he's not specifically bassoon, but there's some great, I mean, like big band sound, and then he even improvises, and it's an older recording from the 50s, maybe, I'm not sure about that. But. So, so this bassoon is, 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 is from another time. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't like there's a, a living bassoon jazz star mm -hmm. of the day. But there's a living jazz bassoonist, Paul Hansen, who's also really excellent. Um, he does a lot of cool stuff with electronics, um, and he also is just a really good, you know, he can just play a really good straightforward bebop style bassoon solo. Um, really a very complete jazz bassoonist, very, uh, somebody who I think we all really admire. Yeah, he was with um, Bela Plutz band for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And also, apparently, um, he there was a Cirque du, Soleil sh Cirque du Soleil show in Japan that uh, was kind of musically built around him. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't and, see it, but yeah, and I, I was friends with him on Facebook, so I saw some posts, and I think he played more than just bassoon. Like he played, um, you know, uh, cultural instruments from was it? Did you say it was Japan? Or... I think it was in Japan. Uh, yeah. We had emailed about Mike's a long time ago, and he mentioned it. Yeah, I just remember seeing him post about the um, the instruments, um, the cultural instruments that he was playing. So yeah, very versatile. He plays tenor sax too. I think he might have started on tenor sax. Do you do do any of you guys improvise with the bassoon? Michael does. No, not on the bassoon. Michael, come on! You play. Well, I mean, you know, we all noodle. Michael has this great ability where you can name any song from any year ever, oh, game. Yeah. and Michael can play it back to you with no mistakes first time. Like, I mean, if he's heard it one time when no, he was no, 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 not like that. <laughs> no, my so, favorite game is the, the Circle of Fifths game that we do <laughs> before concerts. I remember you did that. We do. I can't play that game. You play that game. <laughs> I remember you did it with, um, I, have a, I have a video somewhere of you doing it to, um, Do your ears hang low? <laughs> it was just like going up. I think it wasn't circle of fifths though. I think it was chromatic, maybe. Yeah, chromatic modulation just all the way up. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So right from there. there, from there to improvising is just one little step, right? Just one little step. Yeah. <laughs> there is a question here in the Zoom group chat. There's a lot of regards, but uh, there's a question from Randy Mize, whom you know. Uh, just finished watching the Rite of Spring with Marinsky Ballet. How hard is the bassoon opening in that work? So I'll, I'll start with uh, with Andrew. Um, it depends on, I guess if you're asking me personally, I don't think it's that hard, but only because I've spent so many hours practicing it um, that it's just like, you know, I could pick up my bassoon now and feel comfortable playing it. Um, it is a challenge and um, it takes like years um, to really play it well, but um, that's just my take on it. Jack. I agree with Andrew. I think we've all had like many a, a bad time practicing it. Um, I actually had to play it in a high school marching band performance many times. And um, it's a funny story because we went to a like state marching band competition and um, no one had ever heard of Rite of Spring. And so everyone thought I was messing up with all the grace notes. <laughs> And so we ended up getting like 37th place or something horrible. All because of you? And everyone blamed me. Everyone was like, Jack still can't learn his bassoon solo. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, yeah, it was probably terrible, but like they thought the grace notes were mistakes, especially like, you know, the one part with the rhythm. Yeah. That they were like, there's, oh, that's terrible. There's got to be video that somewhere, right? Like, don't oh, there fans. There's a video. On, is it on YouTube? It is on YouTube. What was the name of your high school again? <laughs> Creekview High School. Creekview, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I'm no, gonna look that up after this. I will say that the the solo is nerve wracking in some ways. There are much more like, there are other solos in the repertoire that just make your heart feel like it's gonna come out of your chest. But that one, somehow you feel okay playing. If you have the right read and you know, you feel good then. That's how I feel. My, Michael, what, what's your opinion? I think that's one where it's really scary, right? Because you start the whole piece, like there's nobody else playing. But for me, once I played it with an orchestra, uh, that kind of got me over the mental hump. And after that, it didn't feel as scary in auditions. That's the case for a lot of excerpts, I think. Um, you know, once you play it in context and you remember, okay, it's just, you know, it's another day of work, just part of a piece that I'm playing. And then, say that in a while, but um, it sounds hard. I always get worried for the person playing, like <laughs> nervous, because I can feel it. Even though that that orchestration is so dense, like I'm used to sitting a lot closer to the principal, but there's five, so I'm way down the line usually, and I'm I can still feel the. You know, worry, but I, I'm I'm happy when it comes out. I like it. Have you have you seen? And this is a uh, part of my response to Rennie. Uh, have you seen the painting that that instrument that that instrument refers to? I I shared it with you, didn't I? Yeah, you printed it out when we played it last. I think it was last season. That's right. And you gave it to me. I have it somewhere in here. I, think it's in here. <laughs> I still, I kept it. So that that instrument, I, you know, I, it just left my mind the name in Russian, but it's a very uh, Russian folk instrument that is very basic and very um, unsophisticated in every sense. It doesn't have that many notes. It doesn't have that many that that beauty of tone, but it's 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 very much connected to Russian folklore. And uh, Stravinsky took it from a painting by Nicholas Rurich, who was uh, just amazingly colorful, and it's a painting about spring. And I am sure that if Stravinsky were alive, he would be quite offended by the fact that most people are not 
petrified scared before that solo because I, I think that what he wanted is this like sound that probably wasn't very focused or very clear at the beginning. Uh, while the technical level that you guys have now produces this boom, like that, but maybe in that time produced this whoa, something like that. Um, but I do that many times. <laughs> what? You, I'm you, capable of doing that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said that there are some other, so one, one of you said that there are some other solos that really wouldn't make you much. But, so what would that solo be, Jack? That that. Um, so I, for me personally, the one that I, I've actually performed this piece probably like 20 times at this point, and I still really get nervous playing is Tchaikovsky 6. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> the, I mean, the opening is just, it's scary. It really is. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but that's mine. I just feel like it's, it's an excerpt where it's like pass or fail. There's no gradient, you know? Totally <laughs> it's like, like you <laughs> like miss, like slightly misarticulate one note or like kind of whiff an entrance. It's just like, oh, they can't play the soon. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you miss the note or you're sharp or something. I mean, it's just, it's a disaster. Harder, uh, harder than Chike uh, 5. I think so. Mm -hmm. that's, that's hard itself, isn't it? Isn't it? That, that passage? Do you mean which, oh, the ba -da -dee -da -dee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I think that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, one that with time. The opening yeah. of Tchaikovsky 6 is funny because you would think it plays to our strengths because it's low. Um, you know, a, a lot of the hard solos that you think of for the bassoon are the really high ones, but you know, the low ones are hard too. I would say actually the scariest part of Tchaikovsky 5 is the very first note because it's two bassoons with the two clarinets. It's a B, the which B. Can kind of, it's <laughs> like, it's piano or pianissimo, two bassoons. Um, you and it's, play. yeah, you can, you can place it anywhere like that note is just very flexible and so i i think next time i play it i'm just gonna have one bassoon play because it's so hard to get it to be in tune and together so yeah it's that's the scariest part of jack five for me and um do you think that uh, that the third movement from uh, the ravel g concerto should be played with one or two i like it with two i mean especially like when you have someone as amazing as Michael sitting next to you, <laughs> it is just so easy. You might, you know, might as well just have Michael play the whole thing. But it's it's really, I think it's fun to play it how it's written, you know. And do you think Ravel play because I mean, for whoever, for whomever may not know what I'm talking about, it's a, it's a very quick uh, passage that uh, um, is given to uh, first bassoon and then second bassoon, first bassoon, second bassoon. But it, but to anybody who was not looking it should sound like one so the easiest easiest thing really would you know and some even famous orchestras do it with one some some of them uh but uh do you think that ravel uh that ravel was one of these composers is that this is my theory that ravel was this kind of like uh wanted to mess with people's minds okay uh that he just did that for two bassoons just to make it harder just to say okay here you go play it i think or, if anything or, oh, sorry or did he think that he was making it easier i would think he probably so thought he was making it easier really yeah we have to play the whole the aggregate part when we do it in auditions as you know um and it's really hard to get from one end to the other in one breath you have to play it pretty fast to be able to do that so i i imagine that he was just trying to do the bassoon players a solid um and let them also let them just have you know four beats to let their fingers unpretzel in between licks yeah i also think it's harder the way it's written with splitting between first and second bassoon because we play it in auditions the whole thing and so that's what i always practice um and it's in the fingers so it's, it's hard to like mentally stop like okay we're not in notes <laughs> but like you're so it's so ingrained um and also it's just it's harder to time when to jump in because when you're only playing it by yourself, it's just like, all right, let's kind of go and set it on cruise control a little bit. Um, 
and it's hard to like jump in when the train is already rolling. So, if, if you had to, um, let, let's say that right now you you um, you had the chance to commission a bassoon concerto from wh whoever you want of living composers, who who would you say? I I I want this person to write a bassoon concerto. It, it even if that means somebody that only you know. Um, Jack, who who would you think of? I'm not sure. Maybe someone else can go first. Does anyone have an idea? I have to think about it. Andrew. Oh, uh, or Michael. Michael, sorry. I, I mean, I know he just died, uh, but I'd love more from Elliot Carter for the bassoon. Uh, there's that one piece that uh, it's a. It's not a bassoon concerto. Is it the Osco concerto? Am I thinking the right thing? Uh, where there's a lengthy bassoon solo passage in it that he kind of extracted as a solo work. But I don't think he ever wrote a bassoon concerto proper. I think that would be really nice. Anybody living that I could call and say, <laughs> we're going to commission a bassoon concerto from you? I, I would really love, I think, Hopefully you wouldn't make it too terribly difficult. Um, I would love a Thomas Addis bassoon concerto. Um, it's gonna be hard. Yeah. <laughs> I just love so much um, the colors that he's able to get. Um, and it, it's just all so cool to me. Um, and it's like, it's so blended. There's there's so much, um, like the suite from Powder Her Face. It's just like so crazy out there, not what you think of when you think classical music or even modern classical music. Um, but I just find his stuff so cool. Any any other names? Harrison Burt Whistle. There's a name. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Here's a saxophone concerto. Panic. Oh, yeah. What was the name? Burt Whistle? Burt Whistle. Burt Whistle, yeah. But, yeah, famous. He's, and he's, he's, let's say not up and coming and young, <laughs> well established. In other words, we could not afford. <laughs> uh, you know, that I've, I've always still think is like, there's so much potential for a, for a bassoon concerto. Why aren't there more? Uh, I, I would really love Jennifer Higdon to write a bassoon concerto <laughs> because I think she, she uh, writes uh, very well for every instrument, or at least that's how I experienced her, her pieces. I've, I've done her violin concerto, I've done her viola concerto, and they all have great things for the orchestra. Um, so I would love her to write. And she also has a what I consider a very sophisticated American language. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe maybe nobody has commissioned from her bassoon concerto, but I think I think you guys deserve a you know a ton of great uh, bassoon uh, concerti you know from today. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to share with our audience that you had said you know maybe yes. I just want to say one thing to all the LPO fans out there. My wife uh, Catherine Matushek, LPO violist, and I have. Uh, had a fun quarantine project of fostering kittens for the SBCA. Um, so these guys have been with us since they were uh, just two weeks old and their eyes had just opened and they're almost ready for adoption. So if you're an LPO super fan, and you would like one or two or maybe three uh, LPO raised kittens. Um, these guys will be available through the Louisiana SBCA very soon. This is how many, how many are there? Just three. Okay. That was Lucy and this is Emmett and Batman, the brothers. Oh, wow. But they're very sweet. They love people and they're used to loud instrumental noises in the house. So at least you don't have to worry about that. But and you've, always, you've always liked cats. Oh yeah, we love, this is not the first time we've uh, fostered uh, newborn kittens. Um, I think this is our uh, 16th kitten. Uh, wow. It's a fun, you know, volunteering thing that we can do uh, in the summers when we have a lot of time that we can give to an organization, um, you know, a donation we can make uh, volunteering. Cool. 
Anybody else would like to send a message to anybody? I just think it's great to see everybody. It's been a while. I, you know, I talk to um, people, text them every now and again, but it's nice to be able to, to see everybody. So. Andrew, are you are you able in in Atlanta to like walk around? Is is the? Uh, I mean, yes, but I don't. <laughs> I I'm pretty much staying inside as much as possible. Um, I just saw Patty said, "Hi, hi, hey, Patty." Patty. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm staying in, inside as much as possible, um, trying to still stay active active i got a an elliptical machine so that i'm not just you know sitting on the couch all day there's at least like 30 minutes where i'm not doing that <laughs> um but yeah i'm inside has the aso and so, sorry if i asked something that, that's probably not appropriate but have they do they have a strategy to come back um gotta think how i you know what's what i can and can't say um <laughs> <laughs> At this time, there is, um, we're not planning on canceling the season like we've seen from other orchestras, um, and we're we're seeing how we can be um, still performing in some capacity, um, you know, whether it be chamber music, chamber orchestra, um, but I, I don't think we're planning on you know completely canceling performances. Hopefully, that was all PC to say. <laughs> oh. I think you, I don't know one single, listen, I've been doing this for almost four months now um, and for four orchestras. And I have yet to meet one single person who has not said to me that they're dying to play again for an audience uh, or or to see their colleagues. So uh, I think that, that uh, not only politically correct, but that's a very human response. Uh, and uh, I, I am, you know, I just hope that we can come back in some sort of way. And uh, I, I've been able to interview a, a few people uh, for a podcast that I have with the Orchestra of the Americas, and one of the, one of the, very famous soloists, whom I interviewed answered he's somebody who plays hundreds of concerts a year and tours the world like nobody else and plays for thousands of people and he said that that was his obsession uh, he he was in the middle of a very famous tour playing bach for uh, many thousands and now his obsession has changed from going one to one so and that actually i have to say that the days that i'm get a little bit depressed which it does happen uh i always think that we have an ability to reach people that we have to take advantage of as a as an orchestra or as a group of an orchestra and if that means one person, that that for me right now is enough. I, I, I don't mean to say that it's financially enough. That I'm not I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that if if you know if if I'm right now, if anybody would tell me, um, do you mind playing viola? I don't play viola. I play violin, but I can I can wing I can wing in a viola. Do you mind playing second viola in Mozart quintet? And we're going to record it for this person who is in a hospital. And, and I, this would make my life. It would make my dream. So I think that whenever we come back as an orchestra, as LPO, we will be doing very good to many people in a very creative way. So um, I know that there's a lot of anxiety and uh, I've spoken with many kids who are just starting conservatory and who are wondering whether it's worth it and uh, from the bottom of my heart I've, I've, I've said to them if it's always been worth it now it's twice worth it 
because the value, the importance, and the depth of music will be will be huge. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I say this because I I see a lot of friends. Hello, Val, Patty, Jim Atwood, Eva Liebhaber, Hank Greenwald. Uh, so many people. I mean, really, many many people, musicians, uh, friends, and there's probably people wondering. Does it make sense to even be an orchestra? Well, the, yes, and I think that uh, your abilities as as uh, great musicians will be used in many many ways. I'm actually practicing my violin so that come September, if I if I have to be in front of an audience playing the violin, I'll do it, and uh, I will have no shame if it's out of tune. So that for me is is important because we are all motivated by doing things for people have any of you had and i know that we're over over time i don't know oh my god uh that um have any of you done this that you play for someone that you send them a, a bit of music to make them feel good yeah yeah and I'm actually involved in a project right now um, with her name is Kristen Lynn Fonte, and she has um, a chamber music program in Pittsburgh. And there's a project of um, she chose six artists um, to send around a camera to and to kind of um, have the artist um, talk about their experience during the pandemic and then also play something that means something special to them or that they enjoy. Um, so I, I can't wait to see how that's received. Um, and I think it'll be something really unique and, and cool for the audience. I, I think that there is a way to reach people in September. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just dying to, to see what we're going to do or to see what other people are going to do. I'm, I get these messages from members of orchestras that just did you know a friend of mine played uh, the small version of uh Mahler Das Lied and I was like oh my god you lucky you I mean it's, 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 I would love to do that and if I if I'm lucky I mean normally I have a concert or three concerts a week and I haven't had a concert for a month and I rarely go to hear chamber music which is a like the love of my life and if 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 things go okay i will be able to hear a chamber music concert near where i am next week and that involves uh Anne marie mcdermott our friend the pianist and nice, i nice. know i know that the first note of that mozart piano quartet is going to start and i'm just going to be in tears oh. i've never looked forward to attending a concert as much as I am now uh, to attending a concert where maybe only one piece is played and so if I feel like that can you imagine the audience can you imagine so many friends and so on so so keep, I say keep the keep the energy and keep the faith they're John, John Reeks. Uh, oh, and Stephanie. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Molly and Stephanie and John. Oh, and Eva. Well, I, I actually have a message for Molly. I assume this is Molly Pate or no? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're not going to believe this, okay? This is the first time I'm, I'm accepting this in public, okay? But um, about a month into the pandemic, I started experiencing some back pain, aches in my back. And I think it's just from like my, my body saying, it's like, you know, we, we need you to do, be doing this. Well, okay. So I went to a friend of mine who does, I don't know if Molly does this, but this, this person does flexibility and all these kinds of things. So 
I've been doing this now nonstop for two months, okay? And I have found out that my flexibility was zero or minus 20. <laughs> now I spend between three and four hours a day stretching and doing things that allow me not to have pain in my back and stuff like that. That's something which uh, that same person told me, if you would have kept on going the way you were going, you would have had a, a major body pro problem which would have made you have to stop for a long time. So I'm not saying that I'm happy about this pandemic. I'm just, when I saw Molly, I'm just saying, when I get to New Orleans, which is very soon, I'm going to need a gym and I'm going to need a coach. And I'm not, I'm not assuming Molly is going to be my coach because Molly is, needs somebody, you know, very advanced to coach. But I just need somebody to help me, you know, stretch and uh, work out my glutes. Um, <laughs> so, so this is something I know this. It's happy hour finally, okay? Uh, so, have you been? You were Andrew. You were saying that you were working out a little bit. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and you know, when all of this started, and I was sitting at home all the time. Um, I was just, you know, eating, sitting on the couch, and it was not going to be a good situation at that um, if I kept that up. Um, so yeah, I um, was trying to work out every other day, um, and then I, I went home a week and a half ago to Tennessee to spend some time with family. And then I came back and it's just so hard to get back into it once you've gotten off, off schedule. Um, so I worked out a little bit, took another break, and then now I'm trying to do it every day just so I'm, you know, setting up a routine. Um, but I do notice that, you know, when I got home and from Tennessee, um, I was feeling really stiff um, and just a lot of pain. And then as soon as I started working out, it was so much better. So, um, it's tough to get back into, but if once you do, it's just so such a good feeling. So, all right. Well, I I I feel bad that I've taken so much time. Of, you know, we're, we were supposed to do an hour. We've done an hour and twenty, but I I'm I always always look forward to this moment. And this week was very very special because you you guys are very very special. So uh, before I say my goodbye, I would like to give you a chance to say your own. Start, start uh, Ben, with your last statement. Yeah, this was great. It was great to see everyone. I didn't, um, I never thought that it would disappear when I was playing. So, like, I, like you said, it would be very special to come back to play and play in front of people. And, play together with, with this great orchestra. Um, Andrew. Um, just echo, echoing what Ben said. Um, it's so surreal, um, but I'm glad we're still finding ways to connect. And I think it's um, a good time for lots of flexibility um, and that we can all find new ways of channeling our energies and our expression and what we want to do um, even if that means you know taking a break um, so yeah I think it's um, not a great situation but we can also do some things to um, make it not be a total tragedy if I can say that without sounding too flippant about how serious it is um, but beyond that it's just good to see everybody so mm -hmm. uh, Jack Yep, same as everyone else. Um, I feel very lucky to be able to work with all of you and um, have worked with Andrew a lot in the past. And um, uh, I encourage everyone just to keep listening to music and playing music and um, just, you know, staying safe out there. So good to see everyone. And Michael, I think you're, I think you're, I, I suspect your parents are, or somebody in your family. Because yeah, I the, think so. the, the last yeah. name, Matushek is is only yours. That's not a real common one, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's great to see everybody and uh, looking forward to uh, 
uh, engaging with our audiences uh, with the bassoon in my hands pretty soon. Well, I, I, I think all of you and I, I, I know that that we'll be seeing each other hopefully soon. Uh, by the way, Michael, I value the work that you've been doing on the financial side. And uh, I, I think you are the most proficient financier who plays the bassoon or a bassoonist who is a financier that I know. Uh, Thanks, Carlos. We appreciate uh, your engagement with all that stuff, too. Well, it's been a real learning experience for me, uh, you know, as a musician coming into this different context. My goodness, it's like uh, I, I, I there's one message that I always send in this happy hour. Uh, and it's uh, my search, our search for a generous uh, partner, patron who will help us weather this um, this thing because I cannot think of an institution that's more important for education, that's more important for healing the heart than an orchestra. And right now, no orchestra can come back making any kind of financial sense. Absolutely impossible. If it was already impossible, it's been made totally impossible. But we can reinvent things and we can be we can make a difference in our community if we find the, um, the partners. And so, sometimes these tough times inspire people to be generous and we're going to be working. I'm going to be in New Orleans in three or four weeks and I may be longer than I have ever been in New Orleans um, this, this fall. And I, I'm going to give it all to uh, make this orchestra come back and thrive. And I wish uh, the same for, for Atlanta, um, Andrew. So that's how I finish on a hopeful note, thanking all of you who, who were present in this discussion. And thanks to our fabulous uh, bassoonists who, who participated and uh, see you next week. I don't even remember what's next week, but they're all fun and uh, and for me, it's something I look forward. Okay, so take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody.